Hello to the Steven now, and yes, we are back with another Harry Potter movie review. And today, in the Harry Potter film series, we'll be reviewing the fourth film in the franchise, and that one is... Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, released in 2005. Now, much about this film, after the third one, they brought in on a new director, as the previous uh, director uh, did not... Uh, did not return, and so this time they got Mike Newell. From what I've been gathering behind the scenes, he w didn't really know that much about the book, and and I and when I hear that, I'm thinking, well, that doesn't sound good. As a director, should know fully well of the source material they are adapting. It should also be noted, as I did a little research around this film, this one is often the the um is the most well-received film and one of the best reviewed. It also actually had a few nominations. Uh, it was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Art Direction and won a BAFTA for Best Production Design. And it, so the question is though, with all this, is Goblet of Fire a good film? Without any further ado, let's hop straight into the review. The cast for this film includes our beloved trio back, Daniel Radcliffe still as Harry Potter, Emma Watson as Hermione Granger, and Rupert Grint as Ron Weasley, all back in a fab and all back, all grey, and still fantastic in the role. Uh, we also here have this, t uh, we still have uh, Michael Gambon as uh, Professor Albus Dumbledore. I will be honest, I'm not, now I really like him. But in this particular film, the way he portrays Dumbledore doesn't feel quite right, in all honesty. Uh, we have Alan Rickman back as Professor Snape, always great as ever. Maggie Smith as Professor McGonagall, again, great as ever. Uh, then we have um, Tom Felton back as uh, Draco Malfoy, again, still great as ever, like, honestly really like they'd never left which is always great of course we have uh rubius hagrid betrayed by robbie coltrane again great as ever nice we have <clears throat> we also here have a uh, cedric diggory portrayed by robert pattinson who as we know these days is mostly well known for portraying uh Batman in the recently new Batman film, which again is, again, I by the time of this video, I've not yet seen the film, so I won't know what he does, but I do know him for for his minor role in this, a uh, great supporting role in this, and of course for his role in Twilight, which is arguably his best well-known role to date. We have, of course, uh, Crab and Goyle, still portrayed by Jamie Willett and Joshua Herdman, respectively, again, pretty still the same characters of being essentially Draco's minions. Uh, we also have the Prime Minister, um, the well, the Minister of Magic, I should say, Cornelius Fudge, back, still portrayed by the same actor from the previous film, um, previous film, uh, Robert Hardy. Still, I guess, really, we in this film we get to see a more, of, really, be more of a politician and caring a little bit more about really his position with the magical community than really caring about you know the wizarding community in general we also have a new character of Olive live maxine portrayed by i'm sorry if i pronounced the name wrong francis de la tour i and since she is a headmistress for a um all girls uh wizarding school as they are, as in this film, we have other wizarding schools within the European area coming for this film. So it's not just Hogwarts; there's a few other ones as well. And she's really um, Hagrid's love interest. She's another half, really another half giant, and we can really tell by her size within the film. Of course, we got more characters from previous films back. We got, you know, Neville Longbottom, Dean Thomas, and. Seamus all back. Arthur Weasley, of course, is back. The Weasley twins again are back. But here we've got a few new characters popping up for this film installment this time around. Uh, we have the character 
of Mad of Mad Eye Mooney, who um in the film is presented as an ex aura and a personal friend of um Albus of Albus Dumbledore. He's betrayed by Breeden Gleason. And honestly, he's just a really fun character and really plays a, a huge role in the story and for the infamous twist at the end of the film. Uh, we also here have another character of, uh, we have the character of Flair Delacour, portrayed by, uh, Clemence Pussy, probably butchering that name, and I'm incredibly sorry, and she plays this, um, a contender for the Triwizard Tournament, just like Cedric and Harry will be a participating, she is another participant within the Triwizard Tournament, and is essentially what is... Um, and essentially is this, uh, like, I would say, has this ability to have all men fall for her, you know, it's a kind of curse thing to kind of have. And she is a character that will, actually would appear in later films, and really, and we won't see her, however, until The Deathly Hallows Part 1 and 2. So this will be a while before, you know, that character returns. Other characters that are appearing in this film include the characters of... The character of, I think you can see in this picture, Stavlik Isaac, probably, I'm probably butchering that name, I'm probably not really pronouncing it right, but he is another champion for the film, uh, Victor Krom, and uh, his, um, I'd say the headmaster of that said school is, is a character that actually used to be a former Death Eater, uh, later turned uh, traitor, and as a result, you know, you know, is a kind of a evil presence in the film, at least is what it tries to. The character's name in question is, is Igor Kogorov, portrayed by Pre Grand Ballet. I'm probably butchering these names, and if and I'm completely sorry for that, I do not mean to. I also want to point out, in a if you saw like that little bit before with the Cedric. Uh, the other man standing beside him was actually his father, so I just thought I'd just need to point that out. Rounding out the rest of the cast, some of these are some of my favourites. Of course, we have Ginny Weasley uh, back, still portrayed by Bonnie Wright, and is and just in the previous film, I think she's become more just a background character, but nothing of a character that honestly has a standout. We have the character of Rita Skeeter, portrayed by Marinda Richardson, and essentially is this reporter very much doesn't really report the truth, but over-exaggerates things just to sell more, essentially, newspapers. Uh, we have the character of Barty Crouch Sr., betrayed by Roger Lloyd Pack, and as a well-known stage actor. I kind of remember him from uh, Vicar of Dibley as a reoccurring character, so that's interesting. Other villains we have for this film include, of course, the character... We have uh, Draco Malfoy. We now have the character of Lucius Malfoy, a character that we probably haven't seen since uh, the Chamber of Secrets, and of course that is uh, Draco's father, still portrayed by the same uh, by the same actor, of course, the great uh, Jason Isaac, who of course is magnificent in the role, and of course Peter Pert and there's um Peter Pettigrew is back, still portrayed by Timothy Spall, uh, Spall, probably butchering that name. But of course, there's two more interesting bits of casting of characters in this film. First off, the character of Barty Crouch Jr., betrayed by the ever-so-brilliant David Tennant. Um, David Tennant was huge around this time, especially for him playing as the 10th Doctor in Doctor Who. He has a bit of a little role, but boy, does he steal every moment he's in. It's absolutely fantastic. And of course, we have probably the first ever screen appearance of Lord Voldemort, like, in proper form. Technically appeared way back in the first Harry Potter film, but this is his proper big grand appearance, and he's betrayed by the incomparable um, Ralph Fiennes, who, of course, as I know from a Bond fan, played M from Sky... well, became the new M in Skyfall, and continued in the last two Daniel Craig films. He's brilliant, and I can't wait to explore more about him as we get further on in the review. But with the cast out of the way, let's hop straight into this review. We begin this film with, at a location, at an old abandoned mansion, where the caretaker is slowly making his way in, as curious to why the lights are on. Just as he gets in, he sees 
a meeting taking place with the man in a chair doesn't look human and basically laying out his plan which was essentially which is essentially his master plan for the film the people are there include a character we met from the previous film peter pettigrew but we also see the character um who be will become a sort of mystery so i won't spoil who he is but he is willing to participate in this plan and how essentially he won't fail him now it should be noted that the creature in the well the person that barely resembles a human in the chair is of course pretty much i will spoil it lord voldemort it's it's no secret but just as the caretaker seeing this the snake just happens to slide past him and inform the man in the chair that they are being watched just as peter is about to attack him the man tells him to stop and step aside for the snake nagini to do it and as a result the snake goes and attacks the caretaker and it turns out that this whole sequence might have been a dream as harry potter wakes up he is um staying at the weasley's house but he's, he's not only there but also hermione has also been staying at the weasley house it should also be noted this is probably the first time in the series where we don't get to see the the Dursleys at all in this film. I don't know why, but they were seemingly cut from this film. It's a little bit of a shame, but I kind of guess why. Because I don't see how they could fit it in that film, to be all honest. They essentially are getting ready for what is essentially a Quidditch game. Quidditch game. So, Harry, Ron, Hermione, Ginny, uh, I think the, we the Weasley twins, and Arthur Dursley go, and where they meet Cedric. Um, who happens to be Cedric, who's Cedric's dad, happens to be friends with Arthur Weas Weasley's dad, and the two get acquainted. As soon as Cedric's dad meets Harry, he's, you know, again, like everyone in these films, when they meet Harry for the first time, because he has this legend about him, there's this, like, great, you know, awe about him. They're then using some kind of cup, which is a teleporter, essentially, teleports them all the way to the Quidditch game site, where they go and, you know, watch this grand game. We also run into characters such as the uh, Minister of Magic, Cornelius Fudge, and, of course, the Malfoys. And by Malfoys, I mean Draco and his father, Lucius, who we've met in previous films before. And then we have also get introduced to a character of Victor Crom, who is essentially a Quidditch game player. And just when we think this great game is about to begin, we're going to really experience a great thing. It's cut. However, we're told from dialogue that that team that Ron and Harry were backing lost, so it, it's kind of a shame that that bit was cut, because I would have loved to have seen that, but it is what it is. Anyway, after the matches, they are, you know, just resting in tents, the match grounds are suddenly under attack, led by what are essentially Death Eaters. Now, in the universe, we find out that these so-called Death Eaters are followers of you-know-who. They cause havoc around the whole place, especially towards muggle, uh, muggle-borns. And this is especially, and after it's all done, like the, the badness is all ended, a mysterious figure, the same person we met earlier in the film, you know, comes out, other, you know, the person I was with, Lord Voldemort, Peter Pettigrew at the beginning of the film, comes out and raises his wand and fires what is essentially is the, is essentially the symbol of Voldemort. The symbol of Voldemort, the whole Death Eater logo. It should be noted, in this film, it is it is what it is in the book, traditionally green, but later films would make it grey. A kind of... Now, even though I do like the grey look, I will admit, the green look does... is a bit more imposing and more fearsome. Eventually, he runs off, and just as the, the trio were kind of about to go after him, they are then cornered by Arthur Weasley and, of course, his boss... Barty Crouch, Se uh, Barty Crouch Senior, and essentially how essentially he's under the impression that they caused this, but he said no, and how he watched it, and I like how Harry doesn't know what's fully going on until essentially Hermione has to point out to him that that mark is Voldemort, so this was his kind of doing, and Harry is very much shaken up about the whole ordeal that has happened within the very beginning of the film. They're then on the train ride then to the Hogwarts like the films always do. And during this moment, Harry Potter ends up meeting Joe Chang, a uh, essentially his love interest for this film and the sequel to follow. 
Now, continuing on the train ride, Hermione essentially pressures Harry to maybe write a letter to Sirius to explain everything that had happened, maybe he might know, and Harry does go through with the through with her suggestion and go and writes a letter, and then has his, uh, owl Hedwig essentially go and deliver the message. And just as the train arrives at Hogwarts, other essentially, well, well, other schools are arriving as well. And it's revealed why, because there's a scene that's going to take place that needs to be, you know, further developed. And that's in the Great Hall, where, first off, there's, what's going to be held is the Tri-Wizard Tournament. Where essentially schools from, uh, a champion from Hogwarts, a champion from the two other schools, will come and compete for the Tri-Wizard Cup. And a champion will be chosen, and of course you have to be of age... So, essentially, from Harry's year, I would say Harry's year down, aren't really, you know, going to participate, or won't be able to participate. We also, and as a result, we also meet the other characters within the film, or another major character, other than getting reacquainted, of course, with, uh, um, Barty Crouch, essentially senior, we also get introduced to Mad-Eye Moody, and from the dialogue given to us by Ron, he tells us we are essentially informed that he used to be a witch, a um, a uh, an aura, you know, like a witch hunter, you know, that captures the worst of the worst. And in fact, half, nearly all the cells in Azkaban, half the people there are all there because of Mad Eye Moody. And he's essentially here to become the new defense against the dark arts teacher. Mad Eye Moody, of course, is called that because, um, other than the fact that he has a um. Uh, gone mad, which is essentially his known character trait. He also wears this uh, magical eye, eye, and it's courtesy of, I guess, the many years he's been in the business for. It's also established that Mad Eye Moody has a very strong personal friendship with Dumbledore, and I really get the impression that these two have really like been long best friends. So I kind of like that. Now, it's also a thing to be pointed out how the contestants will be chosen for this event. Basically, they. Uh, for those of, of age, will put their name within the cup, and then the cup will then choose who they considered worthy to participate in the challenge. So, and as a result, we kind of close the scene with one of the uh, Karkarov, who is a, the headmaster for one of the schools coming, essentially, you know, acting mysteriously around the cup. So, we understand this is going to be more of a, a bit of a thriller, a Hitchcock-type film, as the director, um, you know, told what he wanted this film to kind of be. We then go to the usual Defense Against the Dark Arts classes, like nearly every Harry Potter film at least does. Here, Mad-Eye Moody it teaches the three unforgivable curses. We also find out a bit about his eye, as it can see through the back of his head. So, it's... and essentially he's teaching these kids about the class. And the unthree forgivable curses are called that, other than the fact that Hermione says literally they are unforgivable, but using one will give you a one-way ticket to essentially life imprisonment in Azkaban. And then he goes, and Mad-Eye Moody says, technically I'm not supposed to show you, but he feels that you're old enough to know, and then shows the forgivable, the unforgivable curses. One of the three curses that Mad-Eye Moody shows to the class is uh, the Imperious Curse. And he demonstrates this by, you know, mind controlling a spider, or I'm guessing a spider, and basically has to go across the classroom, and people are either laughing at it, but when it's on you, they, you know, scream in terror. And then he, and just when it's a light and funny moment, it then switches to a dark, a very dark one, how he could, like, throw him out the window or drown itself. It's dark and creepy. He also explains that many witches and witches have claimed that they were under the effect of the Imperious Curse during Voldemort's time, a uh, time when Voldemort was, you know, around and a big deal. But the question is, how do you know the truth from the liars? So this really gets the class's attention, and also shows one of these curses, like, to be sort of mind control, which is actually a pretty damn, like, really shows that this is just the tip of the iceberg of what these kind of curses can actually do. I also like that, you know... How he doesn't say Voldemort's name, like everyone, it's either you know who or the Dark Lord. So it kind of just goes, no one wants to really say the guy's name, you know, even after all these years. He then asks for another, cur another curse, and Neville Longbottom raises his hand and nervously says the Cruciatus Curse, essentially the Torture Curse. 
and he shows this by performing it on the spider and Neville is shaking it's almost like he's going through some PTSD and we will find out in the next film why and this is like a little detail that I just noticed he then of course asks Neville to sit down that'll be all and then he goes towards Hermione asking if he could name the final curse she doesn't obviously to traumatize by you know what has transpired and very unsettled which he understands and then he performs it in front of the class and that is of course the killing curse as he calls it Avata Kedavra and kills the spider literally right in front of the classroom especially in front of Harry he then tells that this curse no one's ever survived it except for one person in this very room and goes towards Harry I also should be noting that Mad Eye Moody also tends to throughout the film drink from a flask quite constantly which is a nice little which honestly just shows like a mad he is how probably a drunk and then of course after the scene we get how the students are you know react to his class Hermione doesn't like it the class how you know you know why the unforgivable it's horrible but Ron says well it gives us an insight to what kind of well this is because this is a person that's really been there and just as they're walking by they see Neville just staring out a window clearly you know traumatized which makes us really feel sorry for arguably a very innocent character only for Mad-Eye Moody to come up behind him and ask him to you know comfort tea to essentially comfort him showing and I like how it shows this of Mad-Eye that even though Mad-Eye is a crazy char character he does have a heart and you know escorts him away we again see more of the traditional uh, well, I wouldn't say tradition, but we see more people putting their names into the Goblet of Fire. We then see, of course, the Weasley twins try to do it. Of course, they're underage, but they plan to get around it by using an aging potion. But Hermione says it's not going to work because it was done by Dumbledore. And no way you guys can outdo a magic trick on Dumbledore. They try to do it, but it backfires on them with hilarious results, essentially turning them into old men. It's funny as hell moment and makes me, you know, just, just smile. A little bit of a smirk. We then get to the part of the film where we finally get to announce the people to be competing in the Triwizard Tournament. The people are chosen, representing, and, like, the big reveal, finally. First off, we get Cedric Dig Diggory representing Hogwarts. We then get Fleur Delacour representing her school, and Victor Crom representing hers. So it's a big moment for them to finally do it. But then, mysteriously, out of nowhere, it shoots off a fourth name. And... Dumbledore goes to read it, and as he reads it, he says, under a very small, under the low of his voice, Harry Potter, and everyone's shocked, especially Harry, he did not put his name in, and when Dumbledore says it again, at a louder voice, he goes, and automatically there's a re questions are raised, what's caused this, how did his name get in, but, and, he then go, and then Harry then goes to where all the other competitors are, where you know who've been selected, and they are all shocked to see him. Dumbledore then comes in, running to him, and essentially almost in a threatening way, saying, "Did you put your name in? Did you ask anyone else to do it? Are you absolutely sure?" He says yes, and then he backs off. The one problem I have with this, this is not Dumbledore's character. That's why I've always liked the one. That's not Dumbledore. I mean. He doesn't scream like this. He doesn't get angry at like this. It feels a little bit out of character to do this, especially towards Harry of all people. And I also like how some of them, some of the headmasters from the previous, from the other schools, think, "Oh, Harry did this." However, Madai says, "Only an extremely powerful witch and wizard could put that in the goblet because it's a, because of its charms to prevent anyone from tampering with, and especially ones." As powers like that, clearly the ones beyond of a fourth grader. And he has a point, everyone's agreeing. However, Barty Crouch Sr. agrees with the rules, as in, there's a binding contract. Harry is, as of this moment, a tri wizard champion, something he can't get out of. And Harry's worried, because he doesn't know what's going on, how it's happened, he wants answers. Same as everyone. Later that night, we get the Later that night, we get two scenes that are pivotal to the story. One is Dumbledore with, with uh, Professor McGonagall and Professor Snape discussing the whole event. McGonagall is saying that Harry's just a boy. Get him out of it, regardless of the rules, regardless of what Barty Crouch says. Get him out. However, 
Snape says, although this is regrettable, but if we want to truly find out the mystery, we should let, for the moment, it unfold. McGonagall is definitely against this, because he says, this is a boy, not a piece of meat. However, Dumbledore does agree to side with Snape on this. Reluctantly, though. However, he does turn to Mad-Eye Moody and ask that he keep an eye on Harry. And, of course, he agrees without any hesitation. Also around this time, we jump to a scene in Harry's dorm room with Ron and they get into a fight, or more accurately, Ron rips into Harry. And this is kind of a thing I knew would be coming, slightly. We kind of got a glimpse of it early in the film, and by that I mean on the train, when he couldn't afford any lollies, uh, lolly, well, the, the amount of lollies he wanted, it could only get, like, a small group. Harry said he could buy the rest, but it's like, no, and no thanks. It's alright, no. This is something that was kind of happening for a while. I knew this kind of storyline would be happening. Why? Well, within the trio, Harry's the kind of the big name hero. Hermione's the smartest. Harry, clearly the bravest. Ron is definitely the most loyal, and I guess the most human of the group, but really... He doesn't really contribute, and he's always overshadowed. Come on, he's got brothers that are more successful than him. He's kind of the least... You kind of get the impression, even though I'm sure his parents love him, you get the impression he is the least favourite, and that is kind of sad. And this really affects their relationship through quite a lot of the film. Arguably, I'd say it's kind of justified. I mean, justified a little bit? Not fully, but a little bit. I mean, no one likes to be, you know, overshadowed a lot. Even though Harry, you know, never boasted in his fame and always viewed Ron as his best of all friends, I do feel very sorry for Ron a little bit. Does he go about it the wrong way? Of course he does. But it's understandable from his situation. I like how it also matures the characters a bit. They are really in the middle of high school, so of course their emotions really will run rampant, especially for this film installment. The next scene to follow is Rita Skeeter's scene. Uh, she is essentially a reporter, and she's here to report on all the wizards, you know, witches and wizards to perform in the tournament. However, it's clear that most of the limelight's going towards Harry, which he doesn't like, and she's completely blowing everything out of proportion with outrageous reporting. It's the classic case of reporter that exaggerates the truth, even though there is truth, heavily exaggerates it and ignores most of the actual truth, and it's clearly more about Harry than the rest of the tournament, and Harry is definitely uncomfortable with the whole thing, which, again, Rita Skeeter is a character really loved really well by the fan base. To me, I can see her appeal, but I'm not that big a fan. She only, and honestly, I get her importance and role for the movie, but I'm just not a fan. Later that night, uh, later, Harry would send an owl, owl out for a guest message, and he eventually would end up in contact with uh, Sirius Black through uh, the botley um like wood fire uh which i don't know how but it's magic and essentially contacts him and talks about you know the whole thing and he would know anything he's unfortunately says he doesn't wouldn't know anything and of course it ends around this time ha ron comes and essentially kind of you know still on bad terms with ron so we get that kind of scene we later get seen down by the essentially pond where ron where harry is spending time with neville Neville is essentially, well, collecting some kind of herbology, like weed, I guess. And he reveals that this book that he has was given to him by Mad-Eye Moody at the time, you know, when he asked him to come for tea. So really showing how, you know, clearly Mad-Eye Moody, can't, I guess in my opinion, did feel guilty about what happened and was trying to give him something. Or is it, it would make more sense when we get later, but for the moment throughout the film, as I'm interested, I'm really interested in Mad-Eye Mad Moody and especially Neville more of enrollment in the film. By this point, also, ha Ron comes down with Ginny and Hermione, and essentially Hermione acts as sort of like a go-between now because of how bad terms Harry and Ron are, and Ron lets slip to see Hagrid later that night for a very specific reason. Again, the, f the relationship is very fragile, but Harry agrees to go that night. That night, you see ha um, Harry is, again, using his father's invisibility cloak to watch over Hagrid and now... Um, Maxine, the headmistress to of the all girls school that happens to be in town, well, in the school grounds, you know, essentially trying to have a romantic evening before, you know, she walks off. Also, around this time, we see that how they've been smuggling in dragons, and Harry goes and sees Hagrid about this, and it's like, are you joking? And it's revealed that the dragons are the first 
are the essentially the first task for the film. And we also say how, you know, Ron's brother, uh, Charlie, is helping bringing them in. This is another case where he is na Ch where the brother of Charlie is name dropped, but we don't really see him. I always thought that was a missed opportunity, and I'll and honestly, I might explain that a little bit more in Deathly Hallows Part One and Two. Later that day, all the school kids are wearing like these badges to support Diggory, and Harry stinks. Harry kind of gets into a little bit of confrontation with Ron, but it doesn't really do anything. He then Harry then goes to Cedric and asks him if he could speak. His, Cedric's friends thinks oh, a fight's about to break out, but really it's just Harry just going to tell Cedric the dragons are the first task. He's like, are you serious? Yes, now everyone knows. It, and he's like, why do you ask me? It's fair. Kind of like in that thing, and Cedric feels grateful, really. And just as Harry's about to walk away, he says, hey, look, I tell people to stop wearing the badge, and it's just like, it's okay, it's fine. So I like Cedric here. Again, really he's more, like, I kind of get Cedric as a sort of Hufflepuff version of Harry. You know, he's half, where you have, like, the, I say, the ultimate student that defies the entire, cl you know, I would say, um, defies the entire house. Ron's, well, Harry is, uh, Gryffindor, Cedric is Hufflepuff, Draco Malfoy, Slytherin, and in the next film, we're gonna find out who defies Ravenclaw. Just as Harry's leaving, he once again gets into what the films always do, have him in a confrontation with Draco Malfoy, just as a fight's about to break out, especially when Harry, you know, essentially, I wouldn't, um, you know, insult essentially how Drake, um, you know, Draco's, you know, family is absolutely pathetic, which of course hurts, you know, Draco's ego, and just as he's about to essentially use a, you know, put a curse on him, he ends up getting turned into a ferret by Mad-Eye Moody, and, you know, t uh, teases him a bit, McGonagall comes in, and I like the line, it's like, is that a student? Technically, it's a ferret. It's a funny line, and of course, uh, McGonagall does turn Draco back to normal, and just as Draco runs away, saying, you know, how his father will hear about this, I like mad Eye's like, oh, is that a threat? And he basically runs away. McGonagall scolds mad Eye Moody for using this as a punishment, and says, Dumbledore should have told you not to do this. I like how he says he might have mentioned it, and how he's better best to remember it. Uh, McGonagall just owned this, honestly, this scene is honestly funny as hell, especially with Mad-Eye and McGonagall, like, just owning their bits in the scene, it's just great fun, and I enjoyed it. Just as, uh, Mad-Eye Moody walks away, he asks Harry to come with him and goes to essentially his, uh, his office, essentially, and essentially he's here to help Harry, you know, prepare for the, uh, the first task, saying how, you know, they're allowed to use a wand only, and you should play to your strengths. Another bit I really like is we see this uh, kind of, uh, I, I guess, um, cabinet, or I'm not really sure what it is, but as it's shaking violently, and, and Mad Eye says, Don't ask me what's in there, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. And he kind of just, okay, walks away from that little bit. But with Mad Eye Moody's essentially words of advice, Harry begins to prepare himself for the task about to come. Essentially, the next task, they're now in this kind of arena, essentially, and as it was, and essentially, we get this little scene where Hermione's trying to comfort Ron, but Rita Skeeter, you know, poses it as a secret love affair, which is, of course, not true, and it's just a funny little scene, and, and it really just shows, like, Skeeter, like, what kind of a character is. Again, I get her purpose, i just not a huge fan of the character, like many other fans are. I'm just not really, really that interested in her character. But anyway, let's get to the actual first task. Each, essentially, are given a dragon to fight, and, you know, fight, and have to retrieve a golden egg. Now, we don't see the others off, we see the others do their off screen, and Harry goes and does his. Because he's... Harry's greatest skill is flying, he then uses his wand to conjure up a broom and ends up flying around, flying around, and resulting in the dragon actually following him. Um, there was a scene where it was supposed to be in the, uh, the Forbidden Forest, but they decided not to as it was going too far, and mostly did it around the, um, school, uh, the, uh, the Hogwarts actual school grounds thing, but not the Forbidden Forest. But Harry does manage to quickly get the golden egg, and essentially, go, you know, go away. It's revealed that the golden egg is essentially will be a clue to their next task. And, you know, Harry wins and, you know, all the Gryffindors support him. 
and, you know, in their victory within their uh, room. It's also here around this time that, you know, Ron and Harry begin to mend their relationship. As again, Harry revealed that, you know, that fight they had about the pond was to give him info to go for these dragon things. And I like how, you know, he really sees that. And my favorite bit is like, how could you expect a person to do that? It must be mental. Yeah, very. So the relationship gets fixed. And I like Hermione's line is, boys, it's, it's fun as hell. Another scene that kind of happens within the film is, um, again, we have to find out the egg to give a clue for the next task. Ha Harry opens it for this loud scream that annoys the hell out of everyone, but of course quickly closes it. But it is to essentially be the clue for the next task. Uh, we then get the scene with them essentially having uh, breakfast. Again, Harry crushing a little bit on Joe, uh, Joe Chang, a, a student from Ravenclaw, who of course we saw earlier in the film in the train cart. We also here see... Um, Hermione getting very emotional with the uh, newspaper report saying how, you know, how she was pretending, to, you know, how she's, you know, essentially this, you know, womanizer go going from, well, you know, kind of, I guess you would say that, go or manonizer, I would say, going from Harry to Victor Crumb, making her look like the bad guy, really getting on Hermione's nerves, and honestly, again, I get Rita Skeeter's role, but again, not a huge fan of her character, honest opinion. This scene then and goes to with um, a package being delivered to Ron, and he finds this weird-looking, what he thinks is a dress, and goes to Ginny, and Ginny says it's not her hers, and it's revealed to be a dress robe. For what? Well, it turns out with the Triwizard Tournament, there is a Yule Ball. Now, being of the fourth grades and up, uh, it's for them to mandatorily attend, and it's revealed that the Yule Ball is actually a dance. Now, like, now the funny bit is, the girls love to love this, but the boys hate this. Ironically, if I recall correctly, in high school, well, school when something like this happened, no one wanted to dance or do these like you know ballroom dances thing. No one liked it. But McGonagall steals the room once again, commanding the scene. And honestly, the actress playing yeah Mrs. McGonagall, Professor McGonagall, is absolutely fantastic in the role. Absolutely great. And of course, they need to teach him how to dance. So, and with Ron having a sly remark on like how, you know, when McGonagall's saying how it's like, how girls are like a, uh, to burst through, and Ron has the sly remark of, um, I'm sure something's to burst through, all right, but it's not a swan. And then she turns and says how every manly lion prepares to prance, goes to Ron and asks essentially to be, to stand up and be the partner, which is funny as hell. Now she, how he's really getting like teased by everyone, and you know, and my favorite bit is Harry just turns to the Weasley twins, is like, you guys are not gonna let him forget about this, are you? Never. It's absolutely fun, honestly, just fun. And you, and of course, when you have the Weasley twins, you know, they're gonna light up the room. Anyway, they say now it's time to rehearse. Everyone get up. I like how all the guys don't get up. All the girls do. The only guy that really has courage to get up is Neville. And honestly, that shows a bit of his character here in this film, as he's slightly developing a little bit of a backbone. And he's, you know, manning up a bit compared to all the other Gryffindor boys. Hell, you even see a scene where, you know, Neville is, you know, practicing to dance, which is a nice little fun scene. Essentially, throughout the next bit of the film, Harry and Ron are trying to find dates. And, of course, Harry goes to ask Joe Chang, but she says, sorry, I'm going with Cedric. And it's also revealed that she's dating Cedric, so that's a bit unfortunate, you know. And I've been in Harry's position, we find out the crush that you're... Although, he's asked, I've I've sadly been in the opposite situation, about to ask, but, find, but get word in advance that, you know, she's you know, taken as a boyfriend, and then of course you do the right thing and back off. Now, this is the thing that grinds my gears, and I find very unbelievable to buy. And that is... Harry, of all people, struggling to get dates. And I don't get it. If you actually think about it, Harry should literally be the most popular guy in school. He is part of the Triwizard Tournament. He is literally, you know, one of the, you know, it was literally a celebrity the moment he stepped into Hogwarts, courtesy of his mm. legend, before he came in. We also find out that uh, Hermione's got already got a date, which of course Ron was going to ask her to go as a friend. And I'll have Ron go with Ginny, because Ginny can't go, she's a year below, and be essentially her date. But we find out, we later find out, 
and she actually attends the Yule Ball Neville. So that really, you know, I want to say grinds, but that kind of really for them struggling to find dates. Again, I could get with Ron, but Harry of all people struggling to find a date. You know, it just doesn't, I just don't see how he would struggle. That's, but anyway, off that topic, let's get further on to the film. Anyway, Harry and Ron do eventually get dates. Don't know how. With the logic that was presented. Especially when, like, there was the one line was like how Ron was saying, Harry, come on, you literally slay dragons. Anyone can get a date as you. And Harry says, really? Well, I'll take the dragon over this any day. Which is a nice little fun line. But they eventually do get dates and go to the Yule Ball. We also find out that Hermione's date is actually Victor Crumb. One of the fellow contest, you know, Triwizard contestants. And the scene with Hermione coming down the stairs in the beautiful dress, I'm sure this is where I would say many, and I do mean many fellow nerds like me, really developed a crush on Hermione. And for many of us, Hermione was probably our first like major crush. For me, definitely up there. And this is the film where I can say it really happened. Now, the date... Well, the, the contestants date, you know, do their first, their dance first before everyone else does. But it kind of end, but, and throughout the event, Ron and Hermione get into a fight, especially with, you know, clearly Ron being jealous. Uh, really showing a bit insecurity, but also a bit, but it also shows his character to be insecure around this time. And of course, the date, you know, the, the night just doesn't go well for Ron and Harry, as eventually their dates leave them for other guys i'm guessing because like just really sit down and do nothing so it's really sad later on we find out the rot that harry still hasn't cracked the code to the egg as the challenge is literally two days away and we and we get a little bit more insight to hermione's role you know more insight to hermione's relationship with victor crom turns out they don't really talk as much in fact he likes to spend most of the time just looking at his study Later, Cedric comes and offers Harry help by giving him a clear clue to, you know, how to crack the code. Clearly to help out with the whole dragon thing. Again, me really liking Cedric here as a really fun and interesting character. Harry would later go to essentially the girl's bathroom, you know, way back from Chamber of Secrets. And when he puts the egg in the water, it, you know, it turns out like it gives him a clear message. And essentially how the challenge has to involve them being underwater for a long period of time. It is also here where Merlin Myrtle makes her return. We haven't seen her since Chamber of Se Secrets, and she's a nice addition just to be brought back for comedic moments, again still crushing on Harry. Later on we go to the library where Harry is still trying to figure out how to stay underwater for a long period of time. Unfortunately, Ron and Hermione are there to help, but they are proving no results. mad Moody comes and says that these two now have to go, you know, go as a request of Dumbledore. The two leave, and like how mad -Eye Moody points to Neville to really kind of help out. And I like how Neville is trying to give subtle hints to Harry for help. And even though Harry does kind of chew him saying, you know, unless you got a, something that can keep me underwater for a long period of time, you know, to breathe, he says, well, you could always try Gillyweed. And he tries, and he agrees to take it. We get this, and now this was something that was changed in the book. In the book, it was kind of Dobby that gave him that. But I kind of like it was changed to Neville as honestly, Neville was the first one to try and do it, so it made more sense to make the film shorter to give it to Neville. Later on, Harry has the gillyweed and they go around, you know, preparing for the next water task. Now, it's revealed that he could stay under, will last for an hour, he says, most likely. It's like, why? Well, it depends on water and salt water. It's like, are you telling me this now? He goes, I'm trying to help. And I think that's when he kind of backs down, realizing that Neville really is trying to help, especially since he doesn't see Ron and Hermione anyway, doesn't know where they are. We get a little fun little moment from, you know, the Weasley twins, you know, essentially doing like a betting thing to like who will win. And Ginny just kind of pops in and says, oh, stop being mean, you two, essentially. We then get to the scene where they have to essentially dive in for a long and be underwater for at least an hour to, you know, and find a thing that was stolen for them and bring it back within the time minute. Everyone, you know, has their thing, well, what kind of magical ability they've got or thing to go underwater for an hour. In fact, the scene that takes place is actually, if you look in the background, this is where that scene is taking place, underwater. 
and essentially all the contestants go down into the water, and for a moment it looked like Harry might have drowned, but then he dives up, goes back down, I love the little scene where Neville goes, oh my god, I accidentally killed Harry, but after that it was like, you know, great comedic timing. And honestly, the underwater scenes are absolutely phenomenal, like, yeah, like CGI, but it's it holds up very well today, and it's honestly a really great uh, visual effect, kind of like how I viewed Thunderball way back in 65, you know, with that film, with the underwater scenes, this is in the same vein as that, it's absolutely great. We find out that these things that they're supposed to retrieve are actually for people, uh, for people, ironically, Cho, Ron, Hermione, and, uh, for Lord Delacour's, uh, essentially baby sister. However, Ro Harry would have been the first one to complete, but he can't leave everyone all behind, especially since one's, two of them are his friends, and one's technically a crush. So, what I like about this scene is, Cedric completes first when he gets Cho, and basically, you know, warns him, you hurry up, time's running, you know, time could be running out. And then, Harry helps, um, Victor Crumb get Hermione up, and he was about to take Ron up, but he can't leave this baby girl behind, especially since Phil didn't complete and was, you know, in, you know, didn't complete and was essentially kind of disqualified or just put out, put to the side because she got injured. So against all the odds, he tried to save the two as he's attacked by these, I guess, underwater mermaids they've got. But he manages to complete the task, even though he technically finished last after the time limit, because of his determination to make sure that everyone got, you know, one. They agreed to award him second place over Victor Crom, making Cedric first, Harry second, Victor Crom third, Flora fourth. And honestly, this whole scene, the underwater, the excitement energy, the action packed and the thrilling suspense worked well so perfectly tied into a nice bow with a very honestly, this is my favourite challenge of all the three. This is my favourite by a country mile. The scene then ends with them all walking away, and Harry ends up talking to Barty Crouch Sr. And they get to talk a little bit, with you know him condoling about you know his parents, saying how he has an infamous story, but it's also an infamous tragedy. And he, he clearly, in a weird way, trying to comfort him. We can also see something's a little bit off about him. Mad Eye Moody comes along, and says some kind of line, and does a weird little tongue thing that really disturbs Barty Crouch as he walks. Uh, you know, that really disturbs him and makes him walk off. And he says, <laughs> people say I'm mad. Later that night, Hagrid, Ron, and essentially uh, Ron and Hermione and Harry all walking in through the Forbidden Forest, having essentially a time just talking. Eventually, they end up stumbling across the dead body of Barty Crouch Sr. We then cut to a scene when Harry's going to, you know, Dumbledore's office, where Dumbledore, Mount Eye Moody, and Cornelius Fudge are are there, with essentially Fudge arguing with Dumbledore. Kind of showing a little bit about his colours, and we'll find that a little bit more in the next film. Just as Harry's let in, Dumbledore says, oh, we're just having a little disagreement, we'll be back, and but and you feel free to have essentially one of these lollies. And essentially these really sharp things, it gets out of control, and Harry ends up stumbling across this um kind of pool. And it's the thing Dumbledore had at the beginning of the film, when they were coming up with a plan to, you know, you know, have Harry go along with the Triwizard Tournament in order to find out what's going on. Harry sticks his head in, and he ends up in a trial room. Where they are about to convict Victor, um, Sergei Krevinov. Krevinov? Yeah, Krevinov. Who, of course, is the head, uh, who is, um, Victor Krom's headmaster. During this scene, we get to see a little bit more about this trial, as a former Death Eater is giving out names to all the people you know, of former Death Eaters to be captured and thrown away, and thrown in prison, be in prison. And he gives up several, some names. One's, however, dead. One was a high-ranking minister. And it's also revealed that Professor Snape was actually a former servant, uh, a servant to the Dark Lord. However, Dumbledore says, yeah, but he turned spider us at the last minute at great personal risk. So he's vouching for Snape. And as a result, Snape gets off scot-free. We also find out, uh, you know, have Mount Eye Moody in this scene. And it's revealed that the Death Eater, the one that is already dead, that he personally killed, though by the hinting of the lion, took his eye with him. He then goes to reveal one name, how these people were responsible for the Cruciatus, you know, responsible for Cruciatus curse that tortured Neville's 
Neville's parents, the Longbottoms, and when they ask him for the name, he says Barty Crouch. But then he leans forwards and says Junior. And this Barty Crouch Junior in question is actually the mysterious man from the Quidditch Cup, uh, Quidditch Cup that fired the um, dark mark up in the air, and the mysterious figure that was plotting with Peter Pettigrew and Voldemort at the beginning of the film. And this man is cosplayed brilliantly by David Tennant. He's quickly arrested and pretty much in prison. And even though this is such a short scene, and I'm not sure how accurate the portrayal is compared to the book, David Tennant absolutely owns this this very small role, and it's absolutely brilliant and breathtaking. Honestly, he just owns it. Just before furthermore, uh, Dumbledore pulls Harry out of it, and essentially explains how this thing helps him with memories. When he gets too old, he can't remember things, so he'll put a bit of his memory in here and sees a bit more about what's going on. Harry then reveals that the man before, earlier, is Barty, you know, with the, the dream he had, the guy, the Quidditch grounds, that was Barty Crouch Jr. But Dumbledore then reveals that's impossible. Not only was he sent to prison, courtesy of Barty Crouch Sr., but it pretty much affected him to do it. Well, he also reveals that Junior, Barty Crouch Jr., died in Azkaban. So it can't be him. But he says he was there. So what's going on? And Dumbledore just says, sometimes there are questions best to not linger on. And essentially, you know, ask him, you know, to go. You know, to go and, you know, rest. The next scene is ultimately the final challenge. And that is, of course, this uh, maze. Now, because Cedric, Diggory, and Harry Potter are tied for first place from the previous events, they will go first, followed by Victor Crumb and then Fleur de la Cour to go in the maze and find the cup, which is hidden within the maze. But there are traps... But there are some little booby traps kind of ahead, but it's also to play a psychological effect. Now, at first, when I first saw this, I definitely knew I wasn't a fan of this challenge. But after a while, I really got to like it because it plays that sort of psychological effect. And with the first two being more of a physical thing, or well, physical thing, and really showing their prowess with magic, it's nice to also show their physical mental state with a challenge like this and saying how the maze will really change them. I honestly liked it. And honestly, went to, and now I like it. It's honestly my second favorite challenge, honestly. De honestly, and is a pretty damn fun one. Throughout the challenge, um, you know, Fel Delacour is knocked out unconscious, and Harry, you know, fires a uh, signal flare to get her out. And then, of course, he goes across Victor Crumb, who's under the influence of the Imperious Curse and ends up attacking Cedric. Harry goes to help Cedric, but the maze is taking its toll on Cedric, and as a result, you know, he. So, you know, Harry saves, you know, say, manages to prevent the two from essentially killing each other. And just as, you know, Cedric is running for the cup along with Harry, he ends up tripping and, you know, is being taken by the vines. But Harry, with all his strength, decides not to go for the cup and save Cedric. And Cedric is very grateful. He says, for a moment I thought you were going to leave me. And he said, for a moment I was. Some game, some game. Then the wind, then this huge wind comes and the two run towards the cup. Cedric, indebted to Harry, seeing that Harry is truly worthy of the cup, decides, he says, take it, it's yours. But Harry says, we'll do it together. So essentially, it will be a Hogwarts victory and they'll both win equally and fairly. I kind of get the impression around this time, the two really had a great respect for each other and even a friend, friendship was slowly bor being born. And I really like this scene because it came a long way with these two characters. And just as they touched the cup, they ended up getting transported to a graveyard. And they realize, is this part of the challenge? They are both confused. But Harry is slightly, slightly, slightly starting to remember this place as it looks familiar. I also want just to pause here and go back to a scene that I just remembered also plays a bit of a role in the film. Um, with Kurgorov later in the film, after I think uh, the office scene, he opens his arm to uh, Sirius Snape reveals the dark mark beginning to glow again. And, you know, he leaves. Snape goes to Harry and says, how, you know, the challenge was very impressive, what they did with the, um, gillyweed, but noticing some of his stuff are missing from his room, and some of it happens to be, you know, stuff to make Polyjuice Potion, a callback to the, f to the second film, you know, the thing they used to, you know, go and disguise themselves. It is around this time that they, you know, that he says, if he finds out they had anything to do with it, he will get to the bottom of it. Okay, I need to establish this because of the big plot twist will be happening very, very soon at the very end of the film, and it will make it, and it will make sense. Just as they get there, Harry's slowly going around the place, and then he sees the name Tom, Tom, Mar you know, Tom Riddle. 
and tells Cedric they need to get back to the cup now. Cedric's like, what are you talking about? We need to get back now. It's revealed that the cup was actually a teleporter. Teleporter. And with Harry knowing the name Tom Riddle, aka we know who that means, he quickly tells him to get away. Just as they quickly go back, a fire is lit up and Harry begins to suffer in pain with the scar beginning to hurt. Something that happened slightly in the beginning of the film on the train ride. And just as Cedric points his wanted uh, Peter Pettigrew who comes out holding a deformed, essentially Voldemort, um, you know, says, what does he want? Uh, what have you done? What do you want? And Voldemort tells him to go and kill the spare. And with one word, Avata Kedavra, Cedric is killed in front of Harry's eyes. Harry is then levitated and held bound in this sort of stone statue. And Peter Pettigrew recites the ritual to bring Voldemort back. The blood of a father taken unwillingly, the blood of the enemy taken forcefully, and the blood of the servant sacrificed. The master will rise again. Of course, this might be a little bit out of order compared to the film, but, but that's how I remember it. And as a result, Voldemort is brought back to life. As when he dumps you know, the body into the, into the cauldron, all the ingredients, Voldemort is brought back. And for the first time, ladies and gentlemen, Voldemort, at full form, is, in, is brought to this big screen in the fourth installment of Harry Potter. And he then approaches Peter Pettigrew and asks for his wand. And Peter gives him, his, gives him the wand. And then he asks him to give out his hand. Not the one he chopped off, because he chopped off his hand to bring Voldemort back. He asks the other one with the mark. He then calls all his servants. And honestly, Ralph Fiennes is just owning this role. Even though this is the first time like we have Voldemort on proper, proper screen at his full strength. He's dominating the scene and dominating the scenery, the atmosphere, and just the way Ralph Fiennes is delivering his lines. One of the most iconic movie villains, ladies and gentlemen, was born in this scene. He then is then revealed all the um, you know, servants of, of Lord Voldemort. Crab and Goyle's dad, uh, Vlad of Vlad of Mir, and most importantly, Lucius Malfoy. And, you know, and I like how he scolds them for not one of them tried to find him, not even Lucius being what he considered the most loyal. But he says he would, you know, he has been looking. He never gave up. Peter then says, I return, but Voldemort just said, simply out of fear, not loyalty. But he had, but he does agree he has been quite useful and gives him a metallic hand through magic, of course, to make him more powerful. And, of course, Peter is heavily indebted and thanks his master. Voldemort then goes to Cedric and says, what's such a handsome boy? For Harry says, don't touch him. And I love Daniel Radcliffe's performance here. Not only is he showing some backbone in a very dangerous time, but you can also see him scared. He's trying to be strong, but he's also scared. And this is where really Harry properly came face to face properly with Voldemort at his full strength. And honestly, we get a little bit more detail to how Harry survived that infamous night. I was saying, you know, how this... How the lies, the boy who lived, fed his legend. He revealed what really happened that night. As he's revealed that Harry's mother sacrificed herself for her only son. Giving him a love protection so he could not touch him. That's why, you know, he got himself burnt in the first one. In the first film, when he, when he you know, the when they tried to harm Harry. Like, tried to touch him only for the camp, you know, only to get burnt. So that happened. And why he died that night. It was old magic. Something he couldn't foreseen. As... That was kind of Voldemort's weakness. He could never really understand old magic, but the more newer and especially the more darker magic. But now with Harry's blood in his system, he can now touch him without getting harmed. He then lets him go and prepares to essentially have a duel. And I think this scene is just filling up with so much tension. And we see the, the ruthlessness and almost the psychoticness of Voldemort, the darkness, the creature within him. And, you know, it's just really a great scene. And again, Ralph Fiennes delivering a outstanding performance but of course he then has harry you know to have a dual fight harry tries to hide but he says you know i want to see the light leave your eyes and this is my job to finish no one else's so what happens he does go and have a and have a dual fight harry you know start showing some backbone and then they and then they do it is a very fantastically filmed scene it is really gripping and during this happening, for some reason, a cause being broken within the spell. And as a result, previous victims of Voldemort's, you know, victims, their spirit comes and helps Harry. The caretaker from the 
from the beginning of the film. The um, Harry's parents and Cedric. Now, they agreed to hold him off so he can quickly get out. However, Cedric says, he, could you please bring my body back to my father? And Harry agrees. When the Severit is broken, Harry quickly makes a run for the Triwizard Cup and takes Harry's, Cedric's body with him, just as the spirits go to delay Voldemort and his followers. Harry manages to escape, just in the nick of time. And Voldemort is angry, you know, that his nemesis got away. But, but then Harry returns back to, you know, the beginning of, you know, to the arena where, it, you know, where they started the third task that they were doing. And for a moment, everyone's happy. They're back. But then Flora screams, seeing Cedric's dead body. And the, and immediately, everything turns to silent. When Dumbledore and, uh, Dumbledore and Cornelius Fudge goes to Harry, he tells them all, he's back. Voldemort's back. And how, you know, and really, this scene completely changed the series. There were no longer kids' films, ladies and gentlemen. This film, this scene alone, told that these aren't going to be kids' films anymore. Your favourite characters are going to die. More so. More so, this is, I think, a more darker moment compared to the previous film. It's really interesting. Of course, Mad Eye Moody takes Harry away to his office, you know, to get away, you know, and whilst they, you know, take him away, Harry says he couldn't leave Cedric alone, but Dumbledore says, don't worry, you're both here now. Everything's fine. And as they take him away, take him away, you know, Harry away, goes to it, Mano begins to ask what was it like, he gets to see the scar, and asks what was it like, the Dark Lord, to stand in his presence, Harry said it was in, almost like one of his nightmares, but something's happening to Moody, he's acting like he's in pain, he can't drink from the flask anymore that he's been throughout the whole film, he goes looking for more, you know, something to drink, but then let slips up and says, were there others in the graveyard? And Harry says, hold on, I never said a graveyard. How do you know? It's then revealed that Mad-Eye Moody has been responsible for everything. Him putting his name in the cup. The bewitched Krom. The, I'm guessing the killing of Barty Crouch Sr. The, and also, Neville, you know, and he also reveals that he gave the book to Neville to get in that gillyweed. And, you know, he's, and clearly Mad Eye is a fanatic, loyal member to the Dark Lord. As a result of this, you know, he's then going to kill Harry to please his master. And just as that's about to happen, Dumbledore bursts the door and comes running in, you know, along with Snape and McGonagall. Wands pointed at him, they subdue him, and, you know, make him drink this truth serum, where he asks, Do you know who I am? Professor Albus Dumbledore. Are you Alistair Mooney? The guy says, no, he is not. He says, where is he? Is he in this room? Where is he? And then he looks at the trunk that was brought in. You know, the thing that was waddling in the... In the, um... Mad Eyes Moody office before, early in the film. And it's open and reveals the, that there's actually... It's, it's actually big on the inside. And in there is actually really Alistair Moody. Mad Eye Moody, the original. So it's like, wait, if that's him... Snape then investigates the flask and realises... It is Polyjuice Potion. So they realise who's been stealing stuff through Snape's store. They then look at Moody and begin, and well, the imposter Moody, and seeing he's starting to change. It is then revealed that this Mad-Eye Moody this whole time was actually Barty Crouch Jr. He then, Barty Crouch Jr. then opens his shirt, revealing his um, Death Mark logo. Dumbledore quickly grabs Harry's arm with the cutting marks, and it's then revealed that Voldemort is back. The Dark Lord has returned. Snape then leaves with McGonagall. Well, wait, Profe uh, Dumbledore leaves with McGonagall and Harry, and leaves to essentially send an out to band saying that they are missing a prisoner, and Snape has to look after Barty Crouch Jr. The next scene follows a memorial in honor of Cedric Diggory's death, and then the next scene is you know, Dumbledore coming, coming to com comfort Harry on what he had seen and explain the one thing that happened. It's revealed that the ones have some kind of core and it's because they're related, they are brothers. Something that we were told way back in the first film that Harry's wand had a brother, had a brother that ultimately gave him that scar. So we get a little bit of that and when those things happen, these spirits come out. 
later on we get a sort of wrap up of everything with you know with the other schools going away you know bloody uh victor crom you know giving letters to hermione say to contact him over the holiday over the summer and just as they're leaving they are now preparing for what's about to come next because this is big now voldemort's back they don't know what to do i'm mixed on the ending honestly i feel it could be better but it's decent honestly kind of the same way i feel with the previous one it's decent but uh, but this one i don't know something's missing compared to the other one which was a more fun optimistic note and fits the film this one i don't know i felt it could have been written differently but anyway that was harry potter and the goblet of fire so this was the fourth one what do i feel about this film now this is generally a well-liked film amongst the franchise and is often the most liked do i agree with it well I like it. I don't love it, and I wouldn't say I'm on the same level as others, but I like it. For me, again, I view this in the same way as the third one. You know, it's a fun film. While the third one is ultimately what you think of when it comes to Harry, you know, the cinematic equivalent of Harry Potter, this one is a definitely fun, entertainable ride. I feel they could have taken some better liberties, I would say, as I feel this was not really a more Hitchcock type of thriller that the director wanted. However, I do like how the characters are maturing here. As again, this is high school. They're taking full advantage of it by this point. And honestly, the teen drama aspect, well, it's in, for the most part, works. Some don't. The character of Cedric is honestly one of my f absolute favourite characters of the franchise. He reminds you of a Hufflepuff version of Harry Potter. And it's a real shame how his character ends, but ultimately serves a purpose that fuels Harry's fight for later on in the series. Now, Ron being... Ron is finally given some character development here a little bit, showing how jealous he is of Harry, and for good reason. And also, Voldemort's big on-screen debut, absolutely, you know, with Ralph Fiennes absolutely owning the role, and ultimately, when we think of Voldemort, it is Ralph Fiennes' portrayal that comes to everyone's minds. However, there's one thing I'm not a huge fan of. It's, well... It's kind of how... Dumbledore was in this film he yells too lot and scary a little bit well I think it would have worked when you know the Mad-Eye Moody imposter happened it just felt came out of nowhere you know it just it just doesn't feel right this would not be what Dumbledore would do at least throughout most of the film when he did get angry a lot however I felt it would have worked perfectly in the ending because it would have been out of character but because it was done so much it didn't really work I also like how there's some slight character development for Neville here, which will again be explored in the later films, and him becoming more of a further character. And for the small role we got with Barty Crouch Jr., absolutely killing it, killing it with, you know, David Tennant portraying it, absolutely great. Mad-Eye Moody, another great character. Overall, this is definitely a fun film, and I see why it's very liked amongst the fans. Again, I don't like it as much as others, but I do love it nonetheless, but I do like it nonetheless. If I was to rank this, this would probably take the either 4th or 5th spot, because 4th spot, maybe 5th, I'm thinking 4th right now, but this is overall good. I really wish that the mystery with Barney Crouch, with the books, maybe could have been adapted a little bit better here. That, that might have boosted it up for me to be more Hitchcock, but I do like the teen drama aspect, and the underwater scene is absolutely still stands very well to this day, and it feels really good. The Again, there's some mit I've got really some nitpicks. But nothing to really deter my, you know, deter to hate this film. So far, it's a, it's a good film, and I really like it. There we have it. That was Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. A very well-liked film in the fan base. And honestly, you, you heard my opinions on the film. Um, I say give it a watch. If you haven't seen it, give it a watch. You may enjoy it, you may not, but, but you wouldn't know until you try. After this film, when this film was released, it received good critical praise. Again, nominated and won a few awards, but most importantly, um, it became one of the highest grossing films of that year, like most Harry Potter films tend to. With a budget of $150 million, it grossed $896.7 million at the box office. With this film, um, it would sadly be the last time where, you know, Mike Newell will step down from, and as a result, just like his predecessor, he only produced, you know, filmed really one, you know, one Harry Potter film. But in many ways, 
the fact that the directors only did one film kind of did bring their stamp onto the films and managed to at least do something. Honestly, third and fourth, I'd say, are the darkest films, really established the series going in a far more darker tone. But with that out of the way, join us next time as the next Harry Potter film we'll be reviewing will be Harry Potter and Order of the Phoenix. Join us next time we review that one. Until then, this has been the Stephen Hour, and ladies and gentlemen, so long for now.